Let's ask God's blessing on the Word of God as we read and meditate. So, our gracious, ever-blessed God, we ask now you'll give us your Holy Spirit, that he would enlighten our minds and reveal to us our own personal need, whether it be saved or unsaved, that we may feel in the depths of our souls the power of your truth. Great God and Father, may we tonight know what it is to have refuge in the Lord Jesus Christ, the one of whom we have been singing. We ask it in his precious name. Amen. Would you turn with me please to Luke chapter 17 then, a passage we're to look at tonight for a little while. Luke chapter 17. Now, there's no doubt that our Lord Jesus Christ on various occasions uttered words of great solemnity. For example, in Matthew chapter 25, we read our Lord Jesus Christ uttering these words, Matthew 25, verse 41, and he's talking about the day of judgment. Then he will say to those on the left hand, depart from me, you cursed into the everlasting fire prepared for the devil and his angels. Or in John chapter 8, you needn't turn to it unless you wish to, John chapter 8, verse 24, the Lord Jesus Christ says, if you do not believe that I am he, that is the promised Messiah, the saviour of the world, if you do not believe that I am he, you shall die in your sins. These are solemn words. And yet, our Lord Jesus Christ uttered other solemn words, and I think it's true to say there can be no doubt that these words we're going to look at tonight are among the most solemn words ever spoken by the Son of God. They're found in Luke 17 and verse 32, where the Lord Jesus Christ said to his hearers, Remember Lot's wife. Remember Lot's wife. So we have here a woman to be, to be remembered. The background to these words relates, of course, to the coming of God's kingdom and the end of the age, the return of the Lord Jesus Christ at the end of the age, the end of the world, that is. And it's clear from this whole passage that our Lord Jesus Christ is deeply concerned to stress to his hearers the great importance of being ready for that awesome day. In other words, not to be caught out, but to be alert and prepared for the most momentous event in all of their lives, in all of history, the coming again of the Lord Jesus Christ. And it's clear that our Lord Jesus Christ in this passage gives two warnings with regard to his second coming. On the one hand, he wants to ensure that his true disciples, so those who truly belong to him, and his followers will not be duped into believing he has returned when in fact he has not returned. You see, he was well aware of the fact that due to the wickedness of the age in which uh, he lived at that time and the fact that these true disciples of his really did long for his glorious return, they might be duped into thinking Christ had come when he actually hadn't come. And that's what verses 20 and 24 are all about. Let me read them to you again. Luke 17, 20. Now, when he was asked by the Pharisees when the kingdom of God would come, he answered them and said, The kingdom of God does not come with observation. Nor will they say, See here or see there, for indeed the kingdom of God is within you. Then he said to the disciples, The days will come when they will, you will desire to see one of the days of the Son of Man, and you will not see it. And they will say to you, so here's the warning the Lord Jesus is giving to his disciples, and they will say to you, look here and look there. Do not go after them or follow them. For as the lightning that flashes out of one part under heaven shines to the other part under heaven, so also the Son of Man will be in his day. So the Lord Jesus Christ is warning his disciples then, and his disciples or would-be disciples now, to be on their guard against false teachers. And the second warning begins in verse 25. 
Let's look at that. Verse 25, the Lord Jesus, but first he must suffer many things. Talk about himself. And it's, a, it's, a, it's a relating to his coming crucifixion on the cross of Calvary. But then our Lord Jesus Christ shows his disciples that before his second coming, before his second coming, the vast majority of men and women on planet Earth will behave just as the people behaved in the days of Noah. Let's read that again. Verse 24 through to verse 27. Sorry, verse 26 to 27. As it was in the days of Noah, so it will also be in the days of the Son of Man. They ate, they drank, they married wives, they were given in marriage until the day that Noah entered the ark and the flood came and destroyed them all. Now there's no doubt that the people who lived in Noah's day, the men and women of Noah's day, were very wicked people. Why else would the Lord deluge the whole world with that flood to destroy every living thing except those that were in the ark? So there's no doubt that the people of Noah's day were wicked but it's not their actual specific sins which are pointed out here. Though we're not to deny the fact of their extreme wickedness in various areas of life and living. But what is being emphasized is this. They carried out their day-to-day -day life and living, some of them quite legitimate activities, secular and so on, as if God did not exist. It wasn't so much that marriage was wrong, it wasn't that marriage was wrong at all. Eating and drinking was not necessarily wrong, and so on. But what was wrong was that they were engaging in these things as if there were no God with whom they had to do. What left, in other words, the, the life they were living left them completely unprepared for the day of God's judgment. Uh, they were totally preoccupied with the things of this life and this world alone. So in other words, they were so taken up with their own lives, they took no notice whatever of Noah. All his faithful preaching over many years fell on deaf ears. That's happening today in our society. And then a similar warning is taken from Lot's experience in verses 28 and 29. Look at the verses with me. Likewise, as it was also in the days of Lot, they ate, they drank, they bought, they sold, they planted, they built. But in the day that Lot went out of Sodom, it rained fire and brimstone from heaven and destroyed them all. Again, we have to say the people of Sodom were indeed guilty of the most lurid and disgusting sins. But it's not so much their sins, the specific sins of which they were guilty that's referred to here. We are not putting aside the fact of their dreadful sinfulness. But what is referred to here is that despite Lot's testimony and ministry, the people just carried on business as usual, day after day, year after year. They completely ignored all of Lot's protestations about their sins and God's coming judgment. And the Lord Jesus Christ says in verse 30, Even so it will be, in the day when the Son of Man is revealed. So men and women will be condemned because they had no time for God. They were preoccupied with themselves and what they wanted to do, doing their own thing, their own way. God was not at all in their thoughts. So they were so wrapped up in their own everyday lives, they gave no time or attention to the things of God and his kingdom. They were indifferent to the fact of God and their sin and their wanderings away from him. And that brings us then to verse 31, where our Saviour gives a serious warning against what we might call an undue attachment to the things of this world and this life. Look at what he says in verse 31 of Luke 17. In that day, that's when the Son of Man comes, when he, his second coming in that day, he who is on the housetop and his goods are in the house, let him not come down to take them away. And likewise, the one who is in the field, let him not turn back. So the Lord Jesus Christ is concerned here to drive the warning home. These solemn words are taken by the Lord. Remember Lot's wife. 
She is a woman to be remembered. And why was that? Why is that? It is because she demonstrates in unmistakable terms someone who had an excessive long for an attachment to the things of this life in this world. That's why she looked back and that's why she became a pillar of salt. That's why she became a lost soul or showed herself to be a lost soul. The whole thing is absolutely tragic, momentously tragic. So I wanted to think of Lot's wife for a few minutes tonight and to remember at least three things about Lot's wife. First of all, there are what we might call the benefits she enjoyed. This is before she was turned into a pillar of salt. The benefits she enjoyed. There are a number of things we might say about the benefits that Lot's wife enjoyed. For example, she had a believing husband. Now we're aware, of course, from the scriptures in Genesis 19 and in 2 Peter and so on, that Lot was not the bright shining light he could have been or should have been. He was materialistic, he was sensual in some ways, he was crass, and so on and so forth. And he certainly was not that spiritually minded man he ought to have been in the midst of Sodom and Gomorrah. He wasn't as close to God as he ought to have been. Let's be in our guard, let's be criticise him and not examine our own hearts. We live in a lurid, filthy, disgusting society. And we can easily be tainted by the things of this society. But here is Lot and he was careless and he was slipshod in certain areas of his family life and living. Yet he was a believer. Now if it wasn't in the scriptures that tells us that, we would say, oh no, I don't think so. He was a believer, he was a man of faith, and there is a world of difference between a man who is an unbeliever and a believer who has many faults. God thinks so, God says so, God testifies to that. So for example, in 2 Peter chapter, one, chapter 2, 2 Peter 2 and verse 7 and 8, we have these words. Listen to what Peter says. He speaks about Sodom and Gomorrah being condemned, how God makes them an example to those who afterward, afterward would live ungodly. Then he says about Lot, he says, and delivered, how God delivered righteous Lot, righteous Lot, who was oppressed with the filthy conduct of the wicked, for that righteous man dwelling among them, now he shouldn't have been dwelling among them, but that's not the issue here, tormented his righteous soul from day to day by seeing and hearing their lawless deeds. So Lot, for all his faults, was a righteous man. He was a believing man, despite all the faults of his life at that time and his living. And we need to keep that in mind. And Lot's wife must have known of his righteousness, however feeble it was in the family home. She must have known of the distress that filled her husband's heart, at the lurid filth, the gross immorality of Sodom, the decadence which was so characteristic of the cities of the plain. She must have witnessed, in good measure, the righteousness of his life. Whether or not times when she heard and observed her husband in prayer to God, when she observed him on his knees to God, maybe confessing his own sins, praying for Sodom itself, for men and women in Sodom, certainly praying for his own daughters and their husbands. And we can't doubt that Lot must have been instrumental in bringing some good and wholesome influence into the family home. His wife must have been aware of that. She must have realised that in some measure it was due to her husband's influence and husband's faith that their two daughters were believers, for they were prepared to leave their husbands to die in Sodom. What union is greater than a married union? And yet these women are prepared to leave their husbands to die under God's wrath in Sodom. 
that speaks of faith in their hearts coming as instrumentally from their father and of course one commentator points out that Abraham was her uncle imagine she could say Abraham was my uncle so there's a benefit she enjoyed a godly husband but there were more immediate benefits that Lot's wife enjoyed she was given a warning of the judgment that would fall on the cities of the plain that's very clear to us in this passage and we have to say that she had no less knowledge of the coming destruction of Sodom than her husband some people might say well did she know much about its coming of course she knew she had no less knowledge of the coming destruction of Sodom than her husband but she was also given a message a message of salvation in Genesis 19 I want to turn that to that passage for a moment Genesis 19 and we find there the angels giving the message to to Lot and his family and so on the angel said escape for your life she heard what Lot and their daughters had heard and she was not only told that the only way of safety was to flee from Sodom she was actually led out of the city an angel of the Lord taking her hand in his hand and leading her to safety putting her on the road to life that's what we find you look at it carefully while he lingered that's Lot there's still Lot is lingering despite his faith so Genesis nineteen sixteen, and while he lingered the men that's the angels of the Lord took hold of his hand his wife's hand and the hands of his two daughters the Lord being merciful to him and they brought him out and set him out to the city, outside the city. So it came to pass when they brought them outside that he said, that's the angel said, escape for your life. Do not look behind nor stay anywhere in the plain. Escape to the mountains lest you be destroyed. And we, we won't read any more of that for the moment. So the, the benefits she enjoyed were immense not only a prayerful husband a husband who had, was a man of faith but the angels of the Lord taking her by the hand imagine an angel taking your hand leading you out of a place of destruction to a place of spiritual everlasting safety she had great benefits but they all proved of no value to her whatsoever and I want to ask you graciously kindly tonight do you have faith in this Jesus? Do you believe the things you hear preaching from his pulpit? Sunday by Sunday, month by month, year by year. You have a Bible to read. Do you read your Bible? That you might learn the things of eternal life. That you may be saved for time and eternity. Have you heard the gospel many times? Have you believed that heaven sent message? Jesus Christ wants you to be saved. God sent his son to save sinners just like you and just like me. So the benefits she enjoyed were of no use to her. What about the benefits you enjoy? You live in a church where the gospel is preached. Well you don't live in it. Well you... We should live in it more, shouldn't we? But you're in a church where the Bible is preached, the gospel is made known. Some of you have known the gospel, about the gospel for a long time. May it be beneficial to you. But notice further, the second thing about Lot's wife. Not only the benefit she enjoyed, there is what I call the sin she committed. The sin she committed. And you think, well, what was the sin she committed? Well, it was not one of the dreadful sins which characterized Sodom and Gomorrah at that time. It was plain and simple disobedience to God. What had God said through his angels? Do not look behind you. Do not look behind you. Remember those words in Luke chapter 9, the words of Lord Jesus speaks in similar fashion. Let me turn to it very quickly. In Luke's Gospel, chapter 9, the Lord Jesus Christ said, said to them, If anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself. So it's Luke 9, verse 23. If anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. For whoever desires to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake will save it. 
For what advantage is it to a man if he gains the whole world, and he is himself destroyed or lost? For whoever is ashamed of me and my words, of him the Son of Man will be ashamed when he comes in his glory, with his, in his, sorry, in his Father's and of the holy angels, and so on and so forth. And then uh, later on in the passage we find these words in verse uh, 60. The Lord Jesus says to this man who said he wants to follow Jesus, he says, let the dead bury their own dead. In other words, the issue here is your own salvation, your own destiny. Go and preach the kingdom of God. So this is what he's telling this man. Another also said, Lord, I will follow you. Let me first go and bid them farewell who are at my house. But Jesus said to him, no one having put his hand to the plough and looking back, Think of Lot's wife. She looked back as fit for the kingdom of God. And there are other references which we shan't turn to. But Lot's wife must have known and must have felt in the depths of her soul something of the solemnity of the occasion with which she was confronted. Think of it again. The angel's visit to Sodom. How the angels struck those men of the city with blindness. The repeated warnings that were given. The urgent manner in which the command to leave was given. Leave, escape for your life. Do not look behind you. Quickly get out to save your life. And she knew that the filthy place of Sodom was doomed. The fire and brimstone was about to fall down from heaven. And she might even have seen that happening as she was turning back. Then the Lord, verse 24 of Genesis 19. Then the Lord rained fire and brimstone and fi- the Lord rained brimstone and fire on Sodom and Gomorrah from the Lord out of the heavens. So he overthrew the cities in all the plain, all the inhabitants of the cities, and what grew on the ground. But his wife looked back behind him, and she became a pillar of salt. So let's think about this looking back for a moment. It's not just a physical look that is condemned here. It wasn't a looking back out of interest or out of awe, as you and I might be awestruck at a tremendous volcanic eruption. We see it on our television screen where we're awe-inspired or an earthquake shaking the buildings of some city. It wasn't that kind of look. That's incredible. Look what's happening. Or the lightning striking the ground. Lightning storm. Nowhere to notice something more profound here. More important here. In the simple words, Lot's wife looked back. It is this. That the backward look of Lot's wife revealed the true state and condition of her heart. She was in love with Sodom. She clearly preferred her life in Sodom to a life with God and God's children. And Lot's wife then looking back shows a woman, who it could have been a man, but it's Lot's wife, shows a woman who in spite of all the benefits she enjoyed was obviously an unbeliever in her heart. Remember the solemn words of 1 John chapter 2, if anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. Now, it well, may well be that her profession before her family and friends seemed genuine and clear enough. Maybe they had inkling that it wasn't as deep as it should be, as sometimes we have in our churches members that sit on the fringe and we wonder, are they truly the Lord's people? Are they truly saved? Are they backslidden or are they lost? We want them to be saved. But for Lot's wife, in reality, she was a false believer. She was a woman who had no saving faith. <coughs> so let's look at this. Sorry, the voice is going. The, the last thing to notice is the judgment she faced. Not only the sin she committed, the judgment she faced. And what a solemn, serious judgment it was. Let's remember... This was not some natural disaster, as we might say. This was God's penalty. 
inflicted on her for one sin, the sin of looking back. Many people in our world today would say, what a vindictive God this is. How spiteful he is. What an awful God this is that he should condemn this woman just because she looked back at the burning cities of the plain. But of course such people, they don't know our God. They don't know anything in reality about him. And we would say, yes, he is a loving and gracious and kind God. And that's why Lot's wife was given a chance to escape with her husband and her daughters. And so she looked back in spite of God's solemn warning. You see, the God with whom we have to do is holy and is righteous. And we can't play fast and loose with him and his commands. We can't pretend to him. We can't lie to him. We can't deceive him. We can't hide from him. And so on the one hand, we might say, well, yes, that looking back by Lot's wife was, in a sense, a small, insignificant thing, just looking back at Sodom. But what it did was to reveal a secret love she had for this world and not for God. J.C. Ryle puts it this way, her heart was in Sodom, though her body was outside. Her heart was in Sodom, though her body was outside. So although she had some kind of profession of faith, perhaps as I say before her family, it seemed genuine enough, but reality, she never gave up the world. Again, we come back to 1 John 2.15. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. So look at this judgment she faced. The judgment she faced then was due to her one sin of looking back with a longing for Sodom. She wanted to keep Sodom. Now I say to my friends, to die at any time and in any place is a very solemn matter. Let's not trivialise it. Let's not sanitize it by pretending it's not as awful and dreadful as it really is. Even if we die surrounded by friends and family, and even if we die with faith in Jesus Christ as our Saviour, it is still a, still a solemn and serious business to die. It really is. It's not a light and trivial thing. But, and this was the case with Lot's wife, to die under God's judgment and to die suddenly when one is healthy and strong to die in the very act of sin to die by the sudden direct intervention of God this is serious it's a serious thing beware my dear friends of openly sinning against God's clear specific commands like Lot's wife had received a clear specific command now we're all weak and feeble and frail when it comes to these things but let's not sin against God's clear specific commands if we find ourselves suddenly doing so let us get on our knees and repent of that sin and seek renewed faith before the Lord and as far as Lot's wife was concerned we need to say furthermore, she didn't just die there in the plain, but became a kind of statue of salt, perhaps to underline the judgment of God, the seriousness of it, and to admonish and warn others who might pass by in the days and the weeks that were to follow. The danger of loving the world more than God himself. So let's wrap this up in some way. A person can have all these immense privileges, a Bible to read, biblical preaching, Christian families, many good things like that, what privileges they were that these wife, Lot's wife had, yet do they do us any good? Are we learning to grow in the grace and knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ? Are we making sure we belong to Christ? Remember the little hymn, the little prayer of the church, child, from this night when I lie down to sleep, I give my soul to Christ to keep if I should die before I wake, 
I pray the Lord my soul to take. We live in a land of Bibles, of good Christian books, of preaching, tapes, CDs nowadays, MP3s, the internet. We can learn great and wonderful things about the word of God and the way to live before him for his glory. Keep these things close to your heart, my dear friends. And no doubt, as I've said already, some of you here tonight, just a few of us in number, you've heard the word of God on numerous occasions. You've heard the warnings to prepare for the coming judgment that others have heard. You have heard. What others have heard, you have heard. You can't say they've heard it. You can say I've heard it. The wonderful gospel of God's saving love and grace in Christ that others have heard, you have heard. It may, may well be that one or more of your family members have become Christians. They know God's salvation. What about yourself? Let me ask you. I don't know all of your hearts. What about yourself? Others in your family have been saved. Are you saved? Are you born again? Do you know Christ for yourself? Are you, you say, well, I'm attached to this church, but are you attached to Christ? Are you savingly joined to Jesus Christ and not just to come into church here? I don't mean unkindly, I mean for the benefit of your soul. Are you attached to the Lord Jesus Christ? Do you know him? Do you love him? Is he your saviour? Is he your Lord? So let's make sure then that when the Lord returns again, we shall be standing not with Lot's wife, and those souls lost for all eternity, but with Lot and all the redeemed of the Lord, saved by faith in Christ, saved by the precious blood of Christ. Now we all feel the pull of this world, we all find allurements in this world, things that draw our minds away, our hearts away, fantasies, ideas, thoughts, ambitions, things that we'd like to do, and we know in our hearts it's an offence to God to want such things. I'm not talking about legitimate things. So let's be on our guard. And remember, we need to guard our heart. Remember how Proverbs 4.23 puts it. Keep the heart with all diligence, for out of it are the issues of life. Oh, to guard, to guard our hearts. This is profoundly important. Surely we can identify the hymn writer in that lovely hymn which begins with the line, O oh, Jesus, I have promised to serve thee to the end. Listen to the words of verse 2. In verse 2 he says, Oh, let me feel thee near me. The world is ever near. I see the sights that dazzle, the tempting sounds I hear. My foes are ever near me, around me and within. But Jesus, draw thou nearer and shield my soul from sin. Remember Lot's wife. <laughs>